graduate student at Ryerson University last year. Uh, I've completed my master's in urban development and I'm now happy to be working with WSP MMM at, uh, well, it's the Thornhill office focused on active transportation, so a lot of focus on cycling. And that's actually a direct result of a lot of this research showed that um, getting people more physically active was a big driver of public health improvement. So it's partially why I followed the career path I'm on. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, very simply, why am I here? What's my passion? Why am I put on this planet? Um, how I think I'm going to follow that goal? And then what I have done and will continue doing to, uh, to realize that. And then I'll close with a brief case study of a consulting project I did last summer at Dialogue Design in Vancouver. So why am I here? My goal is to improve population health and well-being. And um, I'm going to just start with a little story. Um, after I finished my undergrad in geography at UBC, I was fortunate to work in the School of Population Public Health with a gentleman named Dr. Clyde Hertzman, who was a CHR Health Researcher of the Year and really a leader in understanding how the social determinants of health influence children and their development through the life course. So this is a map showing childhood vulnerability, which is a complicated term, but the basic takeaway here is the neighborhoods where there's red, there's something going on there that's influencing their early child development. And obviously socioeconomics and some genetic factors are involved, but there's also the physical design of the neighborhood and the, the communities, the social communities that people live in. This isn't the purpose of this talk. I'm a, a data guy. I just wanted to give you a brief context that my early development was all in the social determinants and understanding what um, modifiable lifestyle and physical environment factors have an influence on health. So we spend a lot of money on health. We all know that's one of the largest uh, federal or provincial budget items. Um, but in the end of the day, a very small amount is spent on health prevention or public health. So what I'm actually doing is taking some data from the health field, a survey of population was at 35,000 person survey from Metro Vancouver, Vancouver Coastal Health put on, and they collected a whole bunch of data by postal code. And I'll get to the, the methods, but this is the health data that I'm working with. So I know a lot about the health in Vancouver. This is a map showing general health. So we know there's some patterns and we need to explain those. And this is just from two years ago, so it's more recent, and this is representative of the population. But I want to explain these patterns using planning data. We know a little bit about lifestyle behaviors. Uh, we know a little bit about physical activity, and we can map those data too. This is old news. We also really want to include a focus on mental and social health dimensions, and thankfully this survey has those data, so I can actually link to that as well. So that brings us to what I'm actually here to talk about. Healthy community design indicators. This is a term that I've generally coined, but it's not new. It's like healthy built environment indicators, performance indicators. There's lots of emphasis on data-based um, evaluation tools. And this concept of healthy communities is not new. Healthy community practice guide I was fortunate to work on at HB Lanark in Vancouver with CIP uh, a few years back. And there's also this really cool toolkit called the Healthy uh, Built Environment Linkages Toolkit that the Provincial Health Services Authority in Vancouver and Fraser Health put together. So I really encourage everyone to look at this document if you're interested in this topic. What they did was outline a framework of five dimensions of planning that everyone agreed based on this Healthy Built Environment Linkages, these factors have an influence on health. And what they did was a literature review came up with these principles, which are very high level, and then they actually link them through evidence to health outcomes. And these are sort of linkages conceptually. But what they're missing is actual indicators of those built environment characteristics. And for me, I'm really focused on the actions, the physical changes to the environment, so I need things to track and measure over time or across neighborhoods. So that's my goal. Um, just check on time here. I think we're doing all right, five minutes in. So the bulk of my focus is going to be on my master's research, which was developing a set of indicators and then actually statistically linking them to health outcomes. And broadly speaking, these are some of the themes I looked at, things like access to grocery stores, people who can walk to transit, uh, access to green space. 
I really tried to be comprehensive because I didn't want to focus on one dimension. So how did I actually do that? Um, before I go into this, is there any questions right off the bat? Okay, I know I speak fast, but I really want to tell the story through these maps. So just break down this term for a sec. Community design indicators, those are the measurements of the physical built environment that I'm calculating using geographic information systems, which who does not know what GIS is? Cool, I love planners. Um, it's a tool, so I have data and I can make some quantitative assessments and then output a, a statistical list of scores for every neighborhood. And then I also have for those same neighborhoods a list of those health measures from the My Health, My Community survey. And this is my paper, it's 80 pages, so I don't really expect anyone to read it, but it's on my blog, Healthy City Maps, if you want. This visual story is more what I'm interested in telling. So this is Metro Vancouver. It's a pretty complicated place. Um, there's two health authorities. What I did was simplify that into 105 neighborhoods. And these were the statistical units that were used for the survey. So I was really fortunate to have a friend in the health department who could connect me to those data. And they are publicly released online as well. So it's just a really amazing data set. And hopefully we'll do it in Toronto sometime. So I have these data, and I had to calculate the built environment portion to connect to the, the health outcomes. And the way I did that is by neighborhood. So if you're a GIS geek like me, you know that's a boundary or an aerial unit. You can measure an average score for physical features. But some of those indicators I actually did based on network analysis. So if you want to know how many people can walk to a grocery store, instead of drawing a circle, you can draw a network-based uh, catchment or walk shed. And then I, instead of just looking at percentage of the neighborhood in this certain area, I looked at the individual people per census block and calculated scores for each neighborhood that assess how many people can walk to a grocery store. So everything's about people and access. And that's really the, the population-based approach I'm trying to develop here. This is very small, so I'm not going to expect you to see it. But this is 16 themes of indicators that I came up with, grouped within the same five big themes that the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit used. So I tried to align this to the health research that's already going on and develop this suite of indicators to build out that toolkit and provide some data to back up what they were basically assessing based on the literature. So things like population density, that's not new, but I looked at it six different ways. Um, some of the other indicators I looked at were jobs housing balance, the fraction in each neighborhood, uh, land use mix, which you can use the Simpsons diversity index and actually it's like one neighborhood with one land use is not great, but if you have lots of different uses that's better. Uh, distance to city centers, I'm going to go through these in more detail, but some of the really exciting ones were access to grocery stores and uh, access to transit was pretty important. So my approach, what makes it different, is it's using an objective approach. So I'm not evaluating anything. I'm just, here's the neighborhood, here's the results, and I can calculate this for neighborhoods, I can calculate it for walk sheds, or for cities, as I'll show you in the end. It's all based on open data. So I'm a student. I don't have a special right to connect to any private data, aside from the university databases. But in this case, I actually use the Metro Vancouver open data site and census data. Um, so it's a fairly novel approach. Also used open street maps, which has a great set of cycling routes. And I use the Google uh, generalized transit feed specification, GTFS transit data to get route information. So like I said, I can do this by neighborhood, 105 in my case, or I could do it by city or any region. And I can also evaluate future scenarios. So instead of looking at a suite across neighborhoods, I could look at a future dimension, and that's where my case study comes in. And finally, each of these units I have linked to health measures, so I can tell you what the correlation between each factor is. So just to get into the data very quickly, uh, good, I've got five more minutes. So we talk about density a lot. Everyone knows there's gross and there's net. So if you net out all the empty space, you have a very different measure of density. So it's important to look at both because I wanted to know which was more important. And then within this, you see the data by census block, but to get a score for every neighborhood, I then aggregated the average to neighborhood units. So this is the way I, I calculate the data, then I aggregate it. 
And that's just to demonstrate because the rest of the maps are all the raw data. And I wanted to visually communicate the actual results. And similarly, you can aggregate net versus gross, and there's a different pattern. Employment density, similar idea. So I'm getting scores for every neighborhood for all these data. Thankfully, I had land use layers, so I could calculate that diversity index on all the different land use data. I'm going to go through these fairly fast, but just ask me questions if you have any after. And I also have these growth planning sort of containment areas, focused growth areas, and then the uh, urban containment boundary. So I looked at the fraction of people per neighborhood in different growth areas. So that's the kind of land use section. Next, I'm now a transportation planner, so this is kind of what got me my job, is doing uh, more detail on transportation. So we have a road network, that's the basic input, and a lot of people talk about walkability. So in the simplest sense, that would be intersection density. It's a measure of the density of connections. Uh, tight grids are obviously more walkable, and there's lots of research to back that up. I'm not here to reiterate all the research. I'm just here to show you the sort of GIS method. Similarly, I wanted to look at access to cycling infrastructure, and I broke it out by cycle tracks and all routes. So we have a score for population access to these different facilities. And then transit. This is kind of the coolest place because this GTFS data is super exciting. You can do all sorts of things with it. So you can look at if you do a network catchment around all the bus stops and transit stops, you can figure out how many people can access, in this case, uh, people per walk shed of a bus stop. Or you can also look at the total density of bus stops. Or you can look at the density of rapid transit. So this is my favorite map of the whole project. If, uh, what I did was look at the cumulative number of bus stops at every single stop and create a density of all the frequency. So it's kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around, but this is where there's the most service. So it's a little bit of a different dimension to the data. And this is all free, publicly available for every North American city virtually. So I've done this for Kingston most recently, and the sky's the limit. So housing, uh, there's not a lot of data out there, and it's hard. But census, thankfully, has some good information on types of units. Uh, so I just looked at the dwelling types. Access to food, I looked at grocery stores and the walk shed catchment areas. And also the agricultural land, so you can measure what's protected. And finally, green space is a huge topic. I could have done my whole MRP on this alone. But I looked at land cover classes, so satellite imagery, looked at parks, and I also looked at trails, because trails are how people interface with parks. So at the end of the day, I came up with 50 in 49 indicators. So that's one row of data. And then on the other side, I linked it to a correlation with all the health indicators. So then I get this giant matrix. And I completely acknowledge this is correlation. I cannot infer any causation from this. It is statistically just a screening approach. And if I had a PhD, I would do regression and proper controls and all that. But it gives us a good appreciation for, in this case, you can see that blue cluster. Um, well, that's actually related to binge drinking. So people in high density areas have lower likelihood of binge drinking. So people in the country binge drink more. It's an interesting observation. Um, but at the end of the day, I picked out this sort of 16, I think 16 health measures that had the highest linkage statistically or the number of significant relationships with the health measures. So this is the takeaway of my whole MRP. Um, each of the connecting lines shows a statistically significant correlation between a health measure and a planning parameter or a CDI, community design indicator. So by looking at the pattern, you can see there's a lot of relationships with utilitarian walking, obesity, general health, and some statistically significant connections to mood or anxiety disorders, social connections, community belonging. You could spend a week looking at this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think I'm pretty much out of time. One more minute. So I'll just show you the last sort of I actually did this before. This was the preliminary study to my MRP. At Dialogue Design, we had a future growth scenario for the city of uh, Abbotsford. And we were hired to develop an official community plan. So we wanted objective data to tell council, if you adopt a compact growth strategy, you will have more people who can walk to the transit. You have more people who can walk to trans uh, grocery stores. We wanted data to, to back up this compact growth, which if you know Abbotsford is a challenging place to sell high density. 
So we have three scenarios. I spent the summer developing these future models. And then we use MetroQuest to, to do stakeholder engagement based on all this. But if you look at this, you can see there's sort of dispersed, middle, and focused. And based on those population distributions, we calculated meaningful data about how people would live in that future city. So you can say 43% uh, of people will be able to walk to a grocery store versus 14. That was the one takeaway the council loved. They, they were like, all right, density it is. We want a downtown core. In the end, they went with a balanced approach, but it was better than suburb suburban sprawl. Similarly, access to transit. Um, very few people have access to frequent transit, and you couldn't actually justify the business case for frequent transit if you did the sprawl because the threshold wasn't reached. You really need at least 120 or so people per hectare, 30 people per hectare to just make basic transit reliable. So that's a bit of a whirlwind. I think I'm right on time. So thank you so much for your attention and uh, happy to take questions. Because we started a couple of minutes early, there is a few minutes for questions if anybody has any of Anthony while we set up for the next uh, presentation. Everybody awake? Yeah, it's the end of the day. It's tough. Cool. Um, Nicole? Sure. Um, we did a little bit of research actually working with Colliers to explore the feasibility of what you need to make a grocery store viable. And to make kind of a basic grocery store, we came up with a rough ballpark of six to 8,000 people within sort of a, a catchment area. So you need exclusively one grocery store. If you have you know, a highway in and people drive past one, that, there's caveats to that. But So if developers are projecting a new community and they're saying, well, oh, well, that'll be a grocery store, but the density is too low to support that, then you really need to question their intention. And similarly with transit, if you know they're saying, well, it's the highest density suburb in Ontario, but it's still 24 people per hectare, you need 40. You, you need to really have objective measures to score those things. And it's important if you look at net or gross. And so for me, I use this approach in my new practice at WSP to create indicators and evaluate plans before we implement them. So if we're proposing a new cycling facility, we want to know how many people can actually get to it. What's that going to change citywide access to cycling infrastructure? Um, similar with green space, you want a goal of City of Vancouver and Toronto is every person within a 400 meter walk of a, gross, of a park. If you measure that as a circular buffer, that's very different than a network-based connection. So you really need to be transparent in the methods you use. and. Um, have objective criteria to evaluate those. Hopefully that helps. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Tweet uh, me at Healthy City Maps.